Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to the fifth installment of the NHGRI Bold Predictions uh, some seminar series. Uh, for those of you that have been here before, that you'll know what has inspired them. I'll take a minute to uh, show you where you can find all of their predictions. As I said, the fifth installment in the seminar series, and it was inspired by the production of and publication of NHGRI strategic plan at the end of the last year. In that plan, uh, we put forth 10 bold predictions uh, for the future of genomics, each one being uh, something that we have not yet achieved, that we hope we will achieve uh, either in this next decade or the next hundred years. And we built a seminar series around each one of those bold predictions. This is seminar series number five. So at the end of this program, you will have been halfway through the the seminar series. They will continue on through the summer. You can find them in the uh, strategic plan, which is linked off of our website. And today we're going to focus in on a very special one. And this, this today will be slightly different from some of the other some seminars because we're moving to a topic that is of utmost importance for the future of the field. Uh, and the bold prediction for today, sorry, is Studies that involve genome sequences associated with phenotypic information for millions of human participants. We reg regularly featured at science, school science fairs. And this is to take advantage of the vast quantities of data that we're producing both on genomics as well as on phenotypic information. Instead of utilizing um, these data in the high tech uh, environment, we want to democratize these to make sure they're available for everyone. So today, what we've done is invited two very special presenters to talk about how we can get to that vision. How can we get students at science fairs at the high school, maybe even junior high school level to access data? Uh, and to do so, we have invited two people who have made uh, their career uh, goal to uh, enhance genomics education and enhance education in general. This, I would say that anyone listening here has had at least someone in their past, either be teacher or parent, who has helped egg them on and put them forward on their course. Uh, teachers tend to be selfless and inspiring, and we have two of really uh, spectacular teachers here today to discuss the topic. Uh, first is uh, Neil Lamb, he's at the Hudson Alpha Institute, where he's the Vice President of Educational Outreach. And um, he began his career at the Emory University uh, in the human genetics department. We were just talking that Neil and I uh, overlapped very briefly when I was visiting there many, many years ago. Uh, but since his uh, finishing his degree, he's taken a course through it to uh, be a champion for education. And uh, he will tell you a little bit about his path because I think some of you want to know how do you get, how do you get Neil's job and how do you get Chandra's job? Uh, our second presenter is Chandra Jefferson, who right now is working on Capitol Hill, but she made her claim to fame as being a spectacular teacher uh, in the Fairfield County School District in Winsboro, South Carolina, where she had won numerous awards and been uh, promoted to being the chair of the science department. She has uh, sought out fellowships to uh, learn how to become a better teacher uh, when she's already spectacular. That's another life lesson. You can always be better. Uh, and currently she is an Albert Einstein Distinguished Education Fellow working on Capitol Hill to promote STEM and education policy. Uh, she just told us a few minutes ago she plans to stay on Capitol Hill for a little bit longer to try to get the folks on Capitol Hill to understand how important science education is. As I mentioned, uh, they will tell you a little bit about how they got there. So I'm going to leave out some of the background information that we would normally provide you about the candidate. We're also not doing uh, what has been done in the past where we have one person give a talk and another person give a talk uh, and then do Q&A afterwards. We are going to have the Q&A at the end as well as a discussion at the end. But Neil and Chandra know how to get information across and said it's much more effective if the two of them have a conversation and they'll do a little bit of a storytelling. So we have learned uh, how best to present science uh, from Neil and Chandra. So with that, I'm going to turn the program over to them. We will leave time at the end for answering Q&As that you can send in uh, the button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. 
uh, you cannot do the chat function, but you can send in the, the question and answer uh, function. And that will be sent centrally and we'll try to get to as many questions at the end as we can. So I will now turn it over to Neil and Chandra. Thank you, Larry. Um, we are really glad to be here. And uh, Shonda and I are excited to spend some time with you talking about, uh, about this bold prediction number five. Uh, we're going to start actually telling you a little bit more about ourselves. And uh, Shonda, uh, ladies first. So why don't you go on ahead and start? Absolutely. Thank you. We're so happy to be here once again. My name is Shonda Jefferson, and I'm a high school science teacher and STEM educator in Fairfield County School District. Um, I've been teaching STEM for about 10 years, and I especially have focused in um, Title I schools. And my passion is for serving um, historically underserved students and giving them access to opportunity in STEM. And before I get started, you know, to tell a little bit about myself, I have to tell you about the two ladies who sparked my love for science. The first one was my mom. My mama bought me a microscope when I was seven years old. And I was like a little Einstein with that microscope. And then when I was in high school, um, I had a science teacher, her name was Miss Glover. Uh, she was my only, uh, my first and only African-American female science teacher who just poured into me and instilled that love for science and caused me to pursue a degree in biological sciences. So the same way that she poured into me, um, that's a passion that I have for my students and I try to pour into their lives on a daily basis. I believe that all students can learn science and in order for them to learn science, I have to make sure that science is a part of their everyday life or it connects with their everyday lives, whether it's their community, it's pop culture, all of those different facets of life. And that takes creativity and innovations. When my students walk through the doors of my classroom, I encourage them to take on the role of a scientist. And I try to create experiences in my classroom so that kids can develop a love, a greater love and appreciation for science. Um, those innovative ideas and that creativity um, led me to being named the 2020 South Carolina Teacher of the Year, uh, where I was a voice and an advocate for over 55,000 teachers in our state. And I was able to share my love for science um, and share resources with the teachers across the state and also advocate for diversifying the teacher workforce. So I'm an advocate for equity. I believe that all students should, should have access to a high quality and equitable education. And in order for our students, more students to go into STEM fields and for us to have representation in STEM, we need to have a diverse education workforce. So I've toured the country and spoke with legislators. Um, I spoke with higher education officials um, about different ways um, and different strategies that we can utilize to diversify the education workforce. And I am a lifelong learner. In order to make my class exciting, um, I sought out opportunities outside of my rural school district, outside of my state so that I can connect with renowned scientists, learn about the cutting edge scientific research to bring back that information to my students so that they can have access to it and explore the wide range and array of opportunities um, that are out there for STEM careers. Because my goal is for students to go into um, and explore these STEM careers. And if it started with that one teacher for me, I want to be that one teacher that sparks that interest for my students, as you guys can see in the picture uh, with my student Hannah as she observes those uh, mealworms. And if I could share, you know, uh, one thing, one of my core values, uh, and it goes back to this song, which was one of Martin Luther King's favorite hymns. It says, if I can help somebody as I travel along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or song, if I can show somebody who's traveling wrong, um, then my living shall not be in vain. I feel like I was called to serve. And in this capacity, I'm able to serve students, 
Um, I'm able to serve teachers and um, I'm able to share my love for science. And I hope that, you know, we have a, a bright future uh, in the area of genomics. So just happy to be here today and share some of the ways that I involve my community and my, my students um, in STEM to prepare for this bold prediction. All right, Neil, take it away. All right, fantastic. So I'll tell you uh, my background and my story. Um, and since the bold prediction involves the idea of students doing genomic information in science fairs, I thought I would start with middle school Neil. This is me and a science fair project. I grew up the son of an engineer. And so my science fair projects early on tended towards engineering. That was what I was around. Uh, we're just going to ignore whatever it is that's going on with my hair in this photo. I think I'm probably like 12 in this picture. But anyway, one of the key things, Shonda talked about people who had an impact on her life. This is Miss um, Frances Bowman. And Miss Bowman was my seventh grade science teacher at Hickson Junior High School in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And she was an inspiration for me. I was partly terrified of her, but I was also totally fascinated by all of the things that she brought into my world and experience. And one of my key touch points was in the spring of my seventh grade year when our assignment was to go get a container of water from somewhere in our community that couldn't be from your faucet. And there was a pond up the street from me. So I got this little container. It was clear. There was, you know, I thought there was nothing in it. And together, she had this really cool microscope with two eyepieces so we could both look at the same time. We looked in and this was what I saw and I was captivated. And as I lead education programs now, as I lead a team developing education, we try to come back to this type of story, that it was the right hook, the right activity and the right piece of equipment that can turn somebody on to the wonders of science. So this is my kind of, career path from my undergrad all the way through to my job here at Hudson Alpha. And you'll look at this and you'll see that one of these things is not like the other. And that's the two years that I took after I finished my PhD and did a brief postdoc and worked in a large community church in Atlanta, Georgia, before coming back to Emory in a different role. And the point that I want to make here, this experience was so important for me it put me in a place where I had to talk science. I had to explain science at the intersection or the challenges between science and faith. I had to talk about ethics. I had to put my science into practice and make it understandable. And that's a skill I use every day in my current job. So the unexpected career path sometimes is incredibly valuable. So don't shy away from it. Don't have, you know, if someone says, well, that's the end of your career if you go there, that certainly is not the case. Look for the opportunities, look for the skills you can pick up. I'm now at Hudson Alpha, it's a nonprofit genomics institute in Huntsville, Alabama. It's this really amazing blend of 16 research scientists, all focused on genomics, some in human health, some in agriculture. On the same campus, there are 48 biotechnology companies, some with three or four people, some with 100 people. And then I lead a team of 18 educators and workforce development and genetic counselors. And so it's the blend of the research science and the companies showing the application and the education. And every day, I and my team look for ways to take that incredible science and the science of other people around the world and turn that into things that help people understand the field of genomics more and prepare tomorrow's workforce. So with that, let's jump into our bold prediction. You've already seen that from Larry. It's this idea that using genomic sequence and phenotypic information is gonna be regularly featured in school science fairs. So Shonda, let's talk about our first impressions. So when you first saw that bold prediction, what kind of went through your mind? My first, uh, expression was excitement because as a teacher, I was like, I can't wait to facilitate this type of learning with my students because I host science fairs within my school. So we have STEM fairs every year. And, you know, right now, um, some of my students have some of the basic uh, experiments. So I was like, you know, I cannot wait um, to see students actually analyzing genomic sequences and this being a part of our STEM fair. And I was like, you know, thinking about students going from our school science fair to our state science fair to the, you know, national 
all of that um, with this type of experiment, this type of experimentation. So this is all exciting and I can't wait to, to learn and facilitate this type of learning with my students. I what was really, you? I was really excited about it as well. I mean, you saw the picture of me doing science fairs to think about actually yeah. using genomic sequence uh, is really cool. And then my next thought was, wow, there is a lot of work to this. You know, one of my early science fair projects, I decided I was going to try to clone um, plant cells from, from carrots. And mm -hmm. so I, I got this kit and I set it up in my mom's kitchen and then um, like mycobacteria took over and we had to have the kitchen professionally fumigated and I was banned from using that in my, in my house. And so in my mind, um, I thought, you know, there are some equally challenging issues that we're going to have to get our head around to make sure that we don't end up having to do the equivalent of shutting something down because a project got out of hand. Right. And, and so, so for those of you that are watching, um, there are six key topic areas that Shonda and I want to talk about. We're going to alternate things that have to get put in place some at the, at the school level, the, the middle and high school system, some in the scientific field in order for this bold prediction really to come to pass. And so we're just gonna alternate our way through. So let's start with our first. And Shauna, that goes to you. Yeah, so definitely looking at the foundational genetics knowledge. And I have to put this in here. Neil, I think you are actually the little Einstein. You had me beat with running around with my little microscope if you got shut out from the kitchen. I have to throw that in there. But definitely looking at the foundational genomics, no genetics knowledge. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So I think about communities when I think about this topic. And it reminded me of one of the quotes from one of my favorite books, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, where Lawrence Lacks says, can you tell me what my mama's cells really did? He whispered, I know they did something important, but nobody tells us. So the community, they would like to know um, more information about the basics of DNA. What is the structure? How does it affect our traits? And in this picture, um, I'm actually set up, I, I requested, or ask the South Carolina ETV, so education television, if I could present um, basic information to the public about DNA. So this was my way to kind of celebrate DNA and share that information with the public. So can you tell me what DNA really is? That's what the community would like to know. And we have to figure out creative ways to communicate that information. All right, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, one way that we do that, I think it starts with educator professional development. Educators are the closest to the community and the closest to our kids. So in allowing science teachers to attend amazing professional development so that they can gain the knowledge that they need to share this um, information about genomics and uh, break it down so that it's understandable um, for the public. And I had the opportunity to attend the Princeton um, University Molecular Biology Institute, where I learned the basics of uh, genetics. And I learned about DNA isolation. I learned about bacterial transformation. And I did it alongside scientists and science teachers. And one of my favorite courses to attend, um, shout out to the National Human Genome Research Institute, they host this short genomics course where we're able to learn about the, re the cutting edge research in genomics as well and work alongside educators from across the nation. So we develop uh, lifelong relationships with educators. So some of these educators actually facilitate biotechnology experiments in their classroom. And if I wanna try something in my rural classroom, I can reach out to them. It's like you always have this network and they provide you with a plethora of resources to take back uh, to your classroom. So I love this professional development and that's where we start with that foundational knowledge. Next slide, please. After I gather this knowledge, I take it to my classroom with my students and to teach my students 
the, the foundation of DNA. Of course, I have to make it fun. So one of my favorite projects um, to do in class is have your DNA and eat it too. And as you can see, my students enjoy learning about the basic structure of DNA using these Twizzlers and marshmallows. And then I do something called scaffolding. So I scaffold them to learn about some of the more advanced techniques in biotechnology. So you can see students loading the um, gel electrophoresis um, machines there and they learn a little bit about DNA barcoding and hopefully we'll get closer to um, analyzing DNA sequences, which is um, advanced uh, in my class. And one picture that I wanna point out here, if you look in the upper left corner, one of the students, that was him in ninth grade. And then if you look down in the middle, that's me and that same student. He said, "Miss Jefferson, the experience that you provided me in, in your classes as a high school teacher, it made me want to pursue a career in biological sciences and biochemistry. So I'm standing with that student in as his parent when he was inducted into the um, his honor society, the health science society at his college. And he'll be graduating this year um, with a degree, a degree in biochemistry. So um, this is full circle for me. The things that we do in our classrooms are very important. So next slide, please. So after I teach my students and prepare them um, for these advanced techniques, I allow them to go out and do outreach in the community. So these are some of my students. Um, doing science experiments on the lawn or on the sidewalk and doing a strawberry DNA extraction. So this is a way that my students take the knowledge and apply it in the community. And one of our favorite videos, the strawberry DNA extraction <laughs> video involves uh, Dr. Carla Easter and Dr. Eric Green um, from the National Human Genome Research uh, Institute. So yes, it, this has been amazing. And these are some of the foundational skills that um, the students need to know, teachers need to know, and how my students actually share it in the community. I think that concept of, of scaffolding becomes so important, Shonda, because we've got to give them basic concepts and then we've got to build the pathways that, that bring students to more complex. And, and that's really point number two, which is we've got to move beyond a focus on single Mendelian genes and building Punnett squares. Teachers are experts at Punnett squares. Teachers can teach students how to do some Punnett squares, but we need to actually think about going far beyond that if we're gonna to get to our bold prediction. About 10 years ago, Mike Dougherty, who at that point in time led the education initiative for the American Society of Human Genetics, he and his team did an analysis of the current state standards in life science and compared them to see what, uh, how they stacked up against what ASHG had said students needed to understand about genomics. And they found that there were huge gaps, that there was a huge disparity. And then in 2015, with the release of the Next Generation Science Standards, which intentionally were designed, yes, to focus on content, but also to blend in the practices of engineering and science and cross-cutting concepts and have students move beyond memorization to understanding how science works as a discipline. At that point with NGSS, Mike's group went back and looked at how does the NGSS standards compare against the key pieces uh, of what ASHG felt students needed to know. I'm gonna show you a piece of that uh, 2015 paper. On the left-hand side of the screen, these are the key categories of what um, ASHG felt students needed to be able to understand, you know, the basic nature of genetic material that, you know, DNA and the structure of DNA, how DNA is transmitted and patterns of inheritance, not just single gene, but multifactorial, all of these key pieces. I'm about to break one of my own key rules of education, which is I'm going to show you a part of a slide that has way too many words on it, but I want you not to focus on the words. I want you to focus on the patterns of colors specifically the orange, the yellow, and the blue, because I'm gonna show you the findings of the 2015 paper. And if it's orange, it means that the concept wasn't even covered in the content, either the state standards or the next generation standards. If it's yellow, it was there, but it wasn't adequately covered. And if it's blue, then it was fully covered. So here we go. 
All right, so what I want you to see is that the nature of genetic material at the top and the evolution at the bottom are both blue. Our standards do a fairly good job of providing that coverage, but there's a whole lot of orange and yellow in the middle of that. And again, don't get hung up. Don't, be, don't try to read what those other pieces are. But the point is we still are not doing a good job of providing the scaffolding to get us beyond the basics. And if you look at that in even more detail, these are the kinds of things that we need to make sure we have hands-on materials for and that we are providing content to educators to be comfortable to bring this content to their students. This is what we're gonna need students to master in order for us to meet our bold prediction, in order for students to be doing something with this. And I truly believe the heart, the spirit of that bold prediction is not just that the high-flying students, not just that the straight A students are gonna be using genomic information, but that it is, to use Chandra's words, democratized that more students have access. Maybe Larry's the one that used the word democratized, but to take it out of the hands of just the top students. So here are some groups that are actually giving us additional content and scaffolds. I just wanna throughout my portions of the talk, highlight some resources that are actually doing what we need to do to get us to the prediction. This is learn.genetics. It's put together by the Genetic Science Learning Center in Salt Lake City. It's led by Louisa Stark. They do a wonderful job of creating resources that talk about things like complex genetics and epigenetics and precision medicine in student-friendly terms. And then they have a companion site called teach.genetics that's designed for the educators that provides them with additional resources and how you incorporate this into the class and the way that you ask assessment questions and how you know that you're actually helping your students grasp this content. They created the um, have your DNA and eat it too uh, yes. model. Yes, I love that one. It's a great, great group. My, my hat yeah. is off to the work that they do. And, and Louisa does a fantastic job. And it's not surprising that her group actually now has the all of us um, community engagement piece because they have really mastered how you think about having conversations with different audiences. Another resource is um, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, their biointeractive site. It's full of great videos and additional content, like talking about um, skin color and human evolution or uh, uses of genetics in a forensic setting. Certainly, NHGRI has a whole set of resources and fact sheets that students and educators can use as well that take us to the next level. And then I just have to plug one piece from Hudson Alpha that we crafted specifically to help students understand complex genomic traits and the inheritance. Huntsville is a huge space city. The Space and Rocket Center is here. A lot of NASA work is here. So we created a serious game that um, has students play the role of a, a human resources team member working with an upcoming 20-year launch on a mission to Triton, which is a moon of Neptune. And so each student picks one member of the crew and they look at, for that member of the crew, they look at their family history, they look at their most recent medical record, and they look at a set of SNPs for six different complex diseases. And they determine the overall risk for that crew member to develop these diseases based on all three of those pieces of information and how they weight them. And then... Instead of working individually, they work with five other classmates, each one representing one of the crew members, and now they have to pack the spaceship with things that they need to help keep their individual crew members healthy. And there's not enough room to take everything, so you've got to decide what's most important based on the risks that you're dealing with. And then you launch the ship and you see if you were successful and if the crew survived. These are the kinds of activities that take students beyond the basics and expose them to the nuances associated with the field of genomics, especially as we think about it in a medical context. Okay, Shonda, back to you. Yeah, I, I had to comment on that. I am excited about introducing my students to that Hudson Alpha um, game because that is definitely, um, as you mentioned, we're taking students beyond the hitchhiker's thumb experimentation, the tongue rolling, just that basic identification and providing them with these advanced um, studies. So uh, another thing that we would like to talk about is breaking down barriers to access. And as a rural teacher, you know, this is something that I encounter as I try to give my students access to more of these advanced 
um, studies and experimentation in genomics. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so where I teach, I want to tell you guys a little bit about that. I teach in Fairfield County School District, um, and we serve approximately 2,500 students, and it is in rural South Carolina. Can you go on to the next one? Um, and I want to give you a sneak peek into my classroom. I told my students anytime that I speak that I will take them with me and I'm going to introduce them to the world. So this is my science class. And when students walk into my classroom, we are a family. Um, they know that they are now members of the Geek Squad. And Geek stands for Great Experimenters Exhibiting Knowledge of Science. And they stay lit. And that means leading, inquiring about the world, and teaching what they know. And in this particular picture, and you might not be able to see it, but my students are actually utilizing probeware. And the probeware was borrowed uh, from a university, um, which was about an hour away from our school. So I had to call up the university to say, hey, um, I want my kids to participate in this amazing study. Uh, can I please borrow some equipment? So I had to drive to get the equipment and bring it back. But my students were so excited because they're utilizing equipment that college students and researchers are using. So I, I want to talk a little bit about the barriers that we have to break down in order for students to get to this place. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So barriers to access. The first thing that I would like to talk about is the, the rural uh, broadband access. In, in rural Winsboro, South Carolina, all of my students did not have, do not have internet access. So if they needed to go away from school or away from one of our mobile um, hotspot locations, they would not necessarily have access to some of the programs that uh, require the internet to access some of the genomics, uh, large databases and such. And even in the classroom, the band with within our school. So thinking about infrastructure, um, if they open up some of the programs, the computers crash uh, because we don't have the bandwidth to support um, some of the large data sets. And another thing, a barrier that I, I spoke about prior to this is equipment. Uh, in my, my current school, uh, we had, uh, when I arrived, we had about three micro pipettes. So imagine having a class of 33 and trying to teach kids how to load a well and gel or electrophoresis sharing um, that small amount of equipment. So equipment uh, and resources. Uh, as a first year teacher, I can tell you, um, I did not have a thorough understanding of um, genetic genomics and uh, microbiology uh, or molecular biology. That's why I sought to go out to other places to get those resources. And when I went to Princeton, they actually shipped me kits so that my students could have access to um, experimentation. And uh, I learned how to connect with uh, local universities. So scientists in my area, you know, the closest university is about an hour away. So that is definitely another access or, or a barrier to access. And even trying to get my students um, to some of these locations where they're performing the experiment. It's not that we don't have access to a bus, but um, you know, paying for, for the gas to go in the bus or find it, paying the driver's salary. All of these are barriers that we come into when I'm trying to get students a way to experience science um, in this way and to prepare them for um, uh, conquering or, or preparing them for this bold prediction. But um, I have some solutions to these barriers and ways that I've been able to work around it uh, to make sure my students do get wonderful experience in my classroom. Can you go to the next slide? So solutions. Uh, in South Carolina, we have a, a genetic center. It's called the Greenwood Genetic Center. And they wrote a grant to the National Science Foundation for mobile science labs. And what this mobile science lab does, it comes in parks in our rural school area. And students are able to uh, perform several different experiments in genomics and molecular biology investigation. So the mystery of the crooked cell, um, DNA isolation, and just some of the basic courses uh, as well. And then we also 
have uh, colleges that have outreach centers. So Clemson University's Science Outreach Center, they have the Genetics Training Center. So they provide professional development for teachers in areas where we wanna build up and um, help with our misconceptions. And we also have the opportunity to take our students. So here I took my advanced students to the Clemson University Science Outreach students uh, center to participate in this DNA uh, isolation um, activity and several more experiments that they were able to perform during that day. Um, another thing that I've done is partner with the Greenwood Genetic Center and we are in discussion about creating these rural science hubs so that these hubs will be set up as access spots for scientists um, and the community to interact with students and just for them to be able to check out resources to do more advanced experimentation. And they'll always be there um, for teachers to access and for students to access. Uh, and one more thing that I did not list here on my previous slide, I had the applications of Twitter, um, Instagram, and Facebook. When I couldn't reach my kids um, via the internet, all of my students have a cell phone. So we also need to think about how we can make applications that allow students to um, access uh, some of the protein data banks and um, do the gen genomics analysis as well. So those are some of the ways that I think we'll be able to alleviate and break down some of the barriers to, to students um, accessing this information in rural areas. And, and Shonda, there are a handful of states around the country uh, that have those um, either mobile science labs or mm -hmm. lockers of content that they that they send. Alabama has a statewide program. Uh, the challenge is not just getting the content, but making sure that educators are comfortable using yeah. it and that administrators actually are willing to let administrators use that. We've had some challenges where Principals have said, you know, I, I need, you don't need to be doing that. You need to be focusing on this over here. So, so it is really uh, helping people understand at all levels why this content is valuable and how putting this into the hands of, of teachers that are well prepared and confident is so beneficial to students. Absolutely. And I think that's where the um, science hubs, they can serve as training centers for educators. And I know, you know, like I said, my background was in plant physiology. So the molecular biology, you know, I had to go out to places or call up scientists that I knew from my university. It's like, hey, can you help me out with this? Or I want to perform this experiment. Can you walk me through it? And, you know, later on, they started developing training um, um, sessions like you all do at Hudson Alpha, and those are very beneficial to teachers like myself. I really appreciate having that opportunity. And we won't talk about it here, but we could spend an entire session talking about the need to integrate this at the pre-service level. So in yes. college, for people that want to become secondary science teachers, how do we equip them with this content so they come to the classroom already knowing this? But again, we, we, we will not have time for us to cover <laughs> that today. Oh, yeah. Um, it's your time to talk about to stick around and have that discussion with us. Uh, but <laughs> so I'm going to move us on. So one of the next pieces is how do we create data analysis tools that students can grasp that they can that that have some hooks that they can understand. One of the things that I love about being a human geneticist that I am so proud of our community is the willingness to share the data, to make things accessible, and to share the tools that are created to analyze that data. That I've always been so proud of that collaborative kind of, of piece. But that's a real challenge when you try to put that in the hands of a high school teacher or student. I went to GitHub and I typed in genetics and there's 9,000 different resources. And you know, if you put a high school student in front of the genome browser, the, the challenges around that, what we end up doing if we expect students to work with the current existing tools is something that feels much more like this, where we're, uh, students and teachers have no sense of how they even take the first step into what feels like falling off into a giant precipice. So back to your word, Shonda, scaffold. How do we think about scaffolding students to help them with some of these experiences? Um, Charlie Ray leads the education program at the Jackson Labs, and they have a great project called Teaching the Genome Generation that does just that. It's the professional learning 
like what Shonda spoke about that introduces them to genomics and bioinformatics. Something similar is done at Cold Spring Harbor with the Dolan DNA Learning Center and Dave Miklos. Um, they focus not only on what goes in classrooms and kits and activities in classrooms, but a lot of citizen science work. And they've become real experts at DNA barcoding, looking at small pieces of DNA and, and using the informatics to determine where that organism fits into the larger phylogenetic tree. They have a whole project looking at, at ants and, and, um, and other insects and, and bugs to think about what that works. And they've built a project, a program called DNA Subway, and it's a set of bioinformatics tools. And this screenshot, you know, just like a subway through Washington, D.C. or Boston, there are different lines, different, and those lines go through different routes. And sometimes they converge and sometimes they're different spaces. And each one of these lines is a modified set of bioinformatics tools that annotate genome sequences or that analyze um, transcript data. This is like informatics with training wheels on it. And I think it becomes so valuable to give those students a taste of what this looks like. We just recently used DNA Subway at Hudson Alpha. Alabama just celebrated its 200th anniversary of statehood. And we partnered with 24 high schools around the state to catalog native Alabama plants in their communities in partnerships with botanical gardens and nature preserves and master gardeners. And the students went out and identified plants and took a couple of leaf samples and extracted DNA. And in many cases, they sent them back to us for the, for the PCR, we sent it off you know, for sequencing and then sent it back and then they worked through the annotation and identified you know, dozens and dozens of truly Alabama native plants. And this was a great way to take the diversity of the state of Alabama, the resources that are in a student's, in a community's backyard, and these cutting edge tools, but the scaffold of DNA Subway was so valuable. You see the same sort of thing with the Science Olympiad. Protein modeling is now a part of one of the competitions of the Science Olympiad. And Tim Herman and the Center for Biomolecular Modeling in Wisconsin uh, have built a whole set of educational programs in partnership with the Protein Data Bank. Students actually in this part of the competition, they use uh, styrofoam uh, tubers to build three-dimensional models of proteins. And then they go into to JMOL and they build and work with uh, manipulating uh, those different protein models. Uh, this is the kind of thing that, again, we need to continue scaffolding, mm -hmm. but we need to figure out how we get this into broader numbers of classrooms and how we make sure that they are doing the same sort of, of piece. Shonda? Yes. So um, now we're going to go into framing the conversation appropriately when we're talking about uh, like genetic disorders. Uh, how can we make sure that we communicate this well with our students and that they interpret this properly? And, you know, that it's not something that turns into a joke when we talk about this topic, but it's something that um, kids look at and they want to go deeper, gain a deeper understanding about these topics. So can you go to the next slide for me? Um, one of the ways that I do this when my students do genetic projects in my classroom, every high school teacher probably does this when we do our genetic disorders projects. Um, students choose a project and they do the research on it and they present. And sometimes we know that kids at all levels um, dealing with maturity, um, they could turn this project, it could kind of take a turn for the worse. Uh, but this project, I take it kind of like as a theme that goes along with my we are family in my classroom culture. And I turned it into something um, about choosing kindness and acceptance. So I, I'll start with something like this. Meet Maddie. And Maddie is a fun, loving, kind, sweet girl. Uh, she loves to sing and dance. And Maddie is my niece. Uh, she uh, has an extra chromosome on chromosome number 21, and she has Down syndrome. And, you know, just explaining that generates conversations. Do you know, or there are people in your family that have um, different genetic disorders? And we begin to talk about that. So in addition to kind of extend that um, projects, 
I have the groups, each group will research a specific genetic disorder, and then they will have to, in addition, develop an idea to raise community awareness about the disorder or develop a program to increase uh, individuals with disabilities quality of life. So it's kind of taking it a step further. And when they hear about you know, that connection to my family, it creates an empathy and it creates a compassion. This project actually segued into, um, if you can go to the next slide, uh, the theme uh, for South Carolina DNA Day. So, South Carolina DNA Day, it was birthed from uh, my partnership with the National Human Genome Research Institute. Uh, they reached out to several teachers across the nation to help curate um, resources for the 15 for 15 campaign. And out of that, uh, we started South Carolina DNA Day. And for this particular year, um, the theme was the wonder of science. And we focused on genomics being all about kindness, acceptance, and unity because human beings, regardless of race, sex, nationality, socioeconomic side, socioeconomics, um, we're all 99.9% .9 the same. So here's a quick uh, preview of our video from DNA Day, and I can tell you more about it on the next slide. Hi, everyone. There are so many exciting events happening at Fairfield County School District, and the Fairfield Central High School Science Team would like to invite you out to our 2019 DNA Day celebration. Last year, Governor McMaster granted our proclamation request to establish April 25th as DNA Day in the state of South Carolina. On behalf of the House of Representatives and the South Carolina Senate, do hereby proclaim April 25th, 2018 as South Carolina DNA After the request was granted, we hosted a community family movie night and hundreds of students, families, faculty, staff, and community members came out to celebrate. The event featured hands-on science experiments, games, food, prizes, and more. This year, we are hosting our second annual DNA Day celebration, Friday, April 26, 2019. Games and experiments start at 5 p.m. and the movie starts at 7.30 p.m. Save the day, we hope to see you there. So DNA Day is a huge celebration in my community. Um, everyone in the rural community comes together and we have host a family movie night. All elementary school students are invited to do uh, science experiments on the lawn and a lot of them focus on genetics. So we do DNA distract, uh, extractions, DNA bracelets, all of these different things to facilitate learning during DNA Day. Um, and I part it or paired it with a movie night because in a rural community we don't have access to a movie theater so that was an incentive to bring the community out as well and um, we also partnered it with a campaign for anti-bullying so every student that comes in signs an anti-bullying pledge and they learn about the acceptance of differences by watching um, the movie Wonder. Any proceeds that we received from this event was actually donated to the Children's Cranial Facial um, Society for um, research in the area of facial genetic disorders. Uh, the Twisted Science Crew, which is my science club, actually took ownership of this project. And you can see them there, um, a few of them there in the Choose Kind shirts. Uh, those were also some of my advanced placement biology students. And in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see that even our state legislator, um, one of our senators, he came out and actually read the proclamation and participated in the activities too. So this is something huge that happens throughout our community and it's going to be an ongoing tradition and the community learns about uh, DNA. So teachers are encouraged to participate in their classroom um, each day or especially for DNA day. And um, just the community comes out. We also curated resources for uh, K-3 all the way up to 12th grade for everyone to be able to participate in DNA Day. There are so many things about this, Shonda, that I that I love. The fact that you had um, students at all different ages, uh, th things for them to do. The fact that you tied it to the movie Wonder, uh, which has such a great story and message. The fact that your more advanced students took ownership of a lot of this. We talk a lot with our educators about how you frame a conversation around people with disorders, uh, genetic or otherwise, and the importance of person-first language, that it's a, 
It's an individual with Down syndrome, not a Down mm-hmm. syndrome individual. Right. And, and we show them, we, we, we connect them to um, positive exposure by Rick Gudati, which has all these beautiful images of the diversity of individuals with w- w- typical and atypical If we're going to be able to have students, if we want students to be looking at genetic difference and tying that to phenotypic features, Mm -hmm. we need to have a conversation that takes us out of those people are different or there is something wrong. And this Mm -hmm. is such a nice way to to begin to lay the foundation. And by talking about your own personal family connection, you open the door for other other students who have family members that are that are handicapable as well. Right. It is a beautiful event. And I, I'm so proud of my students and even some of the advanced students that lead the elementary school students in the strawberry DNA extraction experiments or leading the building the DNA model or they have sidewalk chalk to draw the structure. You know, you have little five year olds doing this and it's sparking that interest. And I feel like that's opening the door for an entire community to pursue, you know, to see opportunities in STEM in that manner. So that that's getting us closer to that bold prediction. I figure if we start them early, you know, having exposure to this research and this idea, by the time I get them in high school, we'll be presenting these science fair project experiments. That's right. You are not expecting that these five-year-olds can actually, you know, coherently talk to you about Watson Crick base pairing, but all along the way, each of these little things, these little touches provide Mm -hmm oh, I'm really interested in this. How do I learn more? And if we can network those pieces together within communities. So what I'm learning in school ties into after school activities, you know, camps, the Boys and Girls Club, uh, 4-H, you know, Future Farmers, all those different pieces build that broader network that each piece helps prep a student along the way. Yes. That's awesome. So the last of our key pieces um, that, that we think needs to really happen is how do we find engaging ways to, to, to teach this content? Uh, and, and I think it starts with the fact that we love stories. As a society, we love stories. Stories where there's a mystery, where there's a puzzle to solve or a treasure to find. Whether we're reading those ourselves or having somebody read them to us or we're watching them on the big screen or the small screen. And too often, scientists are not as good at telling stories. And and I can say this because I gave my share of science presentations. Our our moderator, who's going to do our question and answer session, Chris Gunter, was a graduate student along with me. She saw plenty of presentations that I did that were not about storytelling and were about let me dump as much information on you as quickly as possible. And we have to come up as scientists with a better way to tell our stories, to partner with educators and school systems, to bring our expertise to the table, but to recognize I'm not talking to my academic colleague, Mm -hmm. I'm talking to a group of 13 year olds or 16 year olds or 65 year olds and how we tell those stories in different ways. We are, accuracy and precision is important in the scientific field and you get dinged and criticized if you're sloppy with your language or if you aren't precise where you need to be. When we talk with audiences about this, I'm not saying we should be sloppy with our language, but we need to dial back some of the, the, the acronyms and the, you know, the $30 words and come back to the wonder of the science. And I'm going to just show you one way that I've done this. And some of you in the audience are probably going to roll your eyes and say, that would never be something that I would do. But I would just encourage you to think about this. I lead a public outreach program at Hudson Alpha called Biotech 101 and 201. And it's open to the public. 101 reaches about 200 adults and um, students in the community every fall with four Tuesday nights of content around genetics and genomics. 201 is offered every February and it's a different topic every February. Um, And I generally have about 300 300 people that come in person and another 200 people that stream it live. And in 2020, right before everybody went into shutdown for pandemic, we talked about the molecules of life and we taught carbohydrates and proteins and lipids and nucleic acid. 
And I was looking for a way to do this that was engaging and told it through story. And so we, did this, we decided to do this through history stories. So we took a different period in history and each one of them, we looked for some connection to one of the four macromolecules of life. And then we told that story and I did it in costume. Uh, each week I partnered with our local theater group and each week dressed up in whatever history window that I was talking about. And for example, with the first week, we talked about lipids, and I talked about the importance of olives and olive oil to the formation of the civilizations around the Mediterranean. And the people in the room tasted olive oil and tasted butter and tasted margarine, and we talked about the different chemical structures, and then we, we dove in a little bit deeper. It also gave us a chance to tie things that are not just scientific to the conversation. So the week that I talked about carbohydrates, and it was um, Industrial Revolution England, I was able to talk about sugars and about starches and about uh, the, the challenges with the sugar plantations and with the cotton plantations and the enslavement of millions of individuals to run those, uh, those enterprises. And we were able to have some difficult but important conversations, science and history and uh, storytelling and, and all of those different components. I'm not saying that you need to put on a wig and hose in order to have a conversation with people about the science that you do, but there's an interesting hook when you come up with ways to tell stories that people don't necessarily expect, when you approach science in an unexpected way. And some of the most incredible science teachers that I know do this very thing in their classrooms, that they tie it to something relevant, a real world setting, whether they're in costume or not, it answers the why would we ever have to know this or when has this ever been useful? And I don't know, Shonda, if you, uh, if you ever uh, do this kind of thing, knowing you, the way that I've gotten to know you, I would imagine you've done something, maybe not in costume, but something similar where you tie these to real world situations. Absolutely. All I can tell you, Neil, is this is stolen. First of all, send me all the costumes. I'll tell you what size and I'll tell you that's good teaching. Uh, this is how I hook my students. Um, when I teach biomolecules of life, I, I talk, I use foods, of course. So bring in different types of foods. And we also do like a, a mystery investigation. One year I did who stole, who stole the principal's iPhone and the thief actually left, uh, left different types of foods on the table where they were eating. And, you know, they had to figure out if it was a coach or the librarian or the custodial worker that was the culprit of taking <laughs> the uh, principal's uh, iPhone. So this, this is great teaching and you have to have a hook. You have to have a story. That's how we reel the students in. That's how we reel the community in. When we connect it to something that they can relate to, even if it's a song. I have students that went on to college and we talk about some of the advanced genomics processes, protein synthesis. Um, they say, oh, we remember that activity that we did. And you know that that's neuroscience. Um, when students, when there's an experience that's created in the classroom or a learning experience, it goes into the long-term memory consolidation. It goes into your long-term memory. So that's what we look for in education, especially K-12 to, to call students to remember these concepts. So my kids do good on their tests, um, especially they would do wonderful on this part if I dressed up. So I'm ready for <laughs> this one. <laughs> one group that does this really, really well is a group called PG Ed, the Personal Genetics Education Project out of Harvard led by, uh, by Ting Wu. And they've created a whole set of these very contemporary storylines and the training for educators to have these conversations. And some of these are really challenging conversations about how cultures bump up against each other and about diversity and difference. And they do a great job of equipping teachers to do this. They also invite scientists to engage with their broader community in these issues of science, to talk to legislators and to consider speaking to the public at library events or in, in, um, in communities of faith. They do a really nice job of, of kind of laying some of that groundwork. And then the last piece before we jump into bolder goals, many of the things that I've talked about actually have been funded by NIH through a program called SEPA, the Science Education Partnership Award. Many of the different groups I've highlighted have SEPA grants that specifically allow us to take the 
cutting edge science and turn it into activities that are used in classrooms and in informal science settings and in museums and in, in videos. And it, if this is a field that you're interested in, those of you that are watching, how do you take your science and turn it into something that has value and provides the appropriate scaffolding and tells the right stories, the SEPA community is something that you might wanna take a look at. So Shauna, that now brings us to, before we move into the Q&A, into Boulder. So yes. uh, I love this, this uh, proposal is bold. It's gonna take a lot, of, a lot to get us to that point, but can you imagine something that actually takes us a little bit further? Yes, Neil, I absolutely can uh, imagine something that takes us a little bit further. And it reminds me um, of my experience. I had the opportunity to design a school with a group of educators uh, from around the nation. And, you know, we had a specific STEM school. But what I see in the future, so similar to the career and technology education space where um, kids learn how to do welding and HVACs and learn a trade. Um, so they're learning right alongside the professional. I see school buildings or community hubs where the science lab is actually where students are learning. So science, the, the classroom-based instruction is happening there, but it's also the laboratory where geneticists are performing their experiments and students just get to see that every day and they're able to communicate with the scientists and they have that partnership so that they are ready um, to perform some of these advanced experiments. So that's bolder for me because, you know, they'll be right there beside the scientists. So it's no excuse, you know, for this bold prediction not actually happening in that space. When we walk students down the hall to the science lab, it really is somebody's science lab. Yes, yeah. real. <laughs> yeah, there, there's, there's, uh, there's so much about that that teaches students the process of science. I think so many of our students still believe that science is a collection of facts that mm -hmm. people already know. Um, and, and, you know, we've clearly seen through the last 15 months with COVID-19 that we learn science on the fly and the science changes frequently. But, but being mm -hmm. able to witness people doing that science, those closer relationships with scientists is valuable. And we've got to think about how we could do some of that in virtual formats as well, or maybe even with, um, with virtual reality or augmented reality for students yeah. that are in rural settings that don't have access to that. All right. Uh, that, that would be amazing, especially. And then also, you know, some of the scientists, if we think about how to get it to the students in a rural setting, is the, the experiment or research in a box. So scientists, uh, however, whatever experimentation they are performing, if it's a way that they could just package it and mail it out um, to different schools so students can see it or carry something out, a small experiment, and have like an extension activity for them, uh, for students to carry out, just to get their mind going and working and get them to understand, you know, what it is that's actually taking place inside of a lab. So I, I, I think like, that'll be great. I think that's fantastic. One of the, one of the bolder things that I thought about, you know, on Christmas day, there's the birding, uh, bird watching activity and people can go outside and can count the birds that they see. And then there's a database that they can contribute to. It's real, it's citizen science and it happens mm -hmm. every Christmas day. Um, I, I'd love to see more of that kind of work within mm -hmm. the field of genetics and genomics. So it's not just students doing these activities as part of their science fair project, but it is actually something that all the students in the class or all those that want to, maybe it's an after school project, actually can participate and they can see how they're contributing to the larger body of science. I mean, those are kind of the, the how do we make this reach even larger yes. numbers of, of students. Ah. I, I love citizen science applications, and I posted one on Twitter recently, and my local news broadcaster, it was the iNaturalist app, uh, she picked it up and, you know, posted it out to the world to say how her boys are participating in this scientific research. So definitely figuring out, you know, how we can make, you know, these applications, you know, so connecting it to the apps uh, where students can utilize to um, analyze DNA sequences and genomic sequences. How can we make this a part of citizen science? 
Maybe that's something we can do, Neil. <laughs> Maybe so. I bet that's a collaboration that we could work on together, most definitely, which, you know, has been one of the nice parts. There are many nice parts about, about being asked to do this seminar and, and getting to do this, but getting to know you and looking for collaborations, it, it's been really lovely. And it's an example of the kind of relationships that we need to cultivate even more of between people in labs and, and people in classrooms. So with that, I will stop sharing and then I'm gonna turn it back over to Larry and then to Dr. Chris Gunter for, um, for our Q&A section. Thank you so much. Very nice to be inspired about teaching as well as in seeing inspirational teachers. I, I wanna just start the conversation because my guess is that you did inspire some of the people who were listening to get more involved in, in outreach. And it brings up kind of two questions. One, uh, what's the best way to learn how to be a better explainer or teacher uh, if you're mainly focused in a lab setting? You practice, I, I can tell you, I used to explain things when my grandparents were alive. That's where I tried to hone what I was doing. I was a graduate student and I had to explain to them at the dinner table what I was doing. Uh, none of my grandparents uh, graduated or even went to college. Uh, and so it was really uh, a good exercise in uh, trial and error and they were patient to listen. So that's one question. And the second question is if these uh, scientists that are listening want to get involved in their local communities, uh, which are diverse uh, and all different things, rural, urban, is there an easy way to do that that um, you can give people tips on? Um, I would like to jump in on the first question about how to explain it. And uh, one strategy that I, I try to use with my students when we're covering something really complex and, you know, even a strategy that I've taken on is how can you turn your research into a children's book or, you know, how, how can you make it so relatable that even a child can understand it. And I know that might be challenging, it might be different, it might be a creative little project for you and your, your science lab if there are any scientists out there, but is it possible to turn your, um, your research into a, a, a children's book? And actually one of my favorite um, uh, scientists who actually exp explained her research in a manner that I could understand um, is a talk on uh, Bonnie Bassler. Uh, Dr. Bonnie Bassler does on how bacteria communicate. My kids love to watch that um, just because, you know, it's saying, oh, you know, these bacteria are talking to each other like we're talking on our cell phones with our friends. So thinking about ways like that, um, the, the, the analogies uh, between what we do in everyday life and, you know, just breaking it down to the most simplistic way of turning it into a children's book, because I, I taught in inclusion classes and inclusion classes included um, students of all different levels and those in special needs. So if I wanted to in introduce a complex topic, um, say, you know, photosynthesis. And I know we're not talking about that right now. You know, with some of my students with disabilities, I'll have to start with the magic school bus get planted, you know, and then, you know, help build up, you know, from there for the other students. So uh, that comes to mind about, you know, the children's book. So how can you break your research down and put it in that format? I think that the power of a good analogy goes far. Uh, never underestimate an analogy to help people understand what you're doing. Uh, Larry, you talked about that you talked to your grandparents. I think practice and practice with somebody that is going to give you feedback that says, I don't understand what you're talking about, or that doesn't make any sense to me. And, and getting frustrated and figuring out, okay, how do I put this in an everyday, an, an everyday type of format? Uh, Looking at science communication, there's some great literature out there about how you communicate science and the ways to communicate complex topics. That's a nice way to, to maybe get an introduction to the field. And also it's important, I think, to study what we know about misconception science, that when people have misconceptions about concepts, you can't just say that misconception is wrong and here's why it's wrong, because what happens is they just sort of layer some of the information you just told them right over top of their misconception. You have to help them confront why their misconception is wrong. And then when their model no longer works for them, then they're willing to construct a new one. So this, 
I'm just going to tell you this is the way this is and your thinking is wrong is going to get us nowhere. Your second question, if you're interested in how you engage with your community, your, your school system, your library, how would you do this? I, I think you start having conversations with with those people. Who's the chair of the science department at your local, at your local school? Um, who leads summer programs at the library or the boys and girls club or, or summer camps? And then once you've started that discussion, you need to be really careful that you don't just say, let me tell you all about this really cool research. And I wanna talk about my research because what they may need is they may need something that is actually an activity around the most foundational piece of your research not let me just jump in with a 54 slide tutorial on the intricacies of my science. So there's gotta be a really, you need to come to the table as a learner, recognizing that you know a lot about your field of science, but how you communicate that to whatever audience you're gonna reach out to, you probably don't know a whole lot about. And other people can help guide you and bring you to that table. I like what you mentioned about going in as a learner. Um, one thing that I would also suggest is, you know, actually getting out and learning your community. If the scientist has the opportunity to visit a classroom and, you know, just do some observations and have conversations with the teachers of science um, and figure out if there is a need. Sometimes those uh, conversations can, can lead to areas where they can um, fill in gaps and, and you know, per perform and, and help uh, where there, where there's, where there's a need. Thank you. I, I, for those of you that are listening live and in, in the northern Hem in, in northern hemisphere, you know summer is about to come and, and school will be out soon. Uh, I know at least uh, a lot of schools, some of the teachers still are around and are accessible and might be a, a good time to to reach out to them as school closes. It's also a good time if you have a, a lab or a research group. Uh, summer's uh, a great time to have teachers come into your groups mm -hmm. to, to learn for a few months or just even observe for a few months. So this more interaction between the academic world and the, um, the K through 12 world, I think would be really helpful. I, I wanted to turn to the bold prediction for, for just a second before we go to the Q and A's. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, our institute and the NIH as a whole is, is really trying to make scientific data available readily to almost anyone in some cases, especially things where it's not human subjects concerns. Uh, and there are vast quantities of these data that are now being put up in the cloud. And the cloud is obviously, it's, we, we, it's not really magical, it's just a computer somewhere. But the beauty of the, the cloud is that you don't need to download the data. You don't need big compute resources at your school. Uh, what you need is a pipeline to be able to interact with the cloud. And I know in our institute, we are hoping to encourage uh, as many people as possible to start to interact with our publicly available data, which is available, when I say publicly available, not restrictions, you don't have to apply to get access to it. Uh, we have human genetic and human genomic data sets, whole genomes that are publicly available. I think one of the key points that Neil, Neil made is that connection is still weak, right? If you absolutely need to know Python in order to interact with the data, that's gonna be a non-starter in middle school. Uh, at least for now. So where do you see the support coming to create those connectors? And, and Chanda mentioned that, I, and a light went off, God, kids may not have a computer in the classroom, but they all have their own cell phones. Mm -hmm. I, I imagine cell phone apps that interact with these data sets uh, could get used a lot. Is that a private sector thing or is that something academics can uh, work on? Is it something our institute should support more of? Uh, people creating those programs smile because yes, we should put more money. <laughs> I'm smiling because you all, I am um, teaching in this rural area. I, the way that I had to do reviews was through like, you know, Instagram live or Facebook live uh, for my students to review for a, a test or a quiz because they couldn't stay after school because it was an hour bus ride to get home. And if you miss the bus, you know, that's it. So creating an alternative way. Um, so, I mean, I think it would be phenomenal for um, the, your institution to invest in creating these applications for students to use their phone um, to, to analyze these data sets. And, you know, 
I think apps, you know, cell phones, texting, TikTok, Twitter, all of those things, that's what we compete with in edu with education every day. So it makes it more accessible. Um, that's how you connect it. It's culturally relevant because that's a part of our kids' culture. You can't catch a high schooler, I mean, middle schooler, maybe an elementary school kid, depending on where you are, without a cell phone. So definitely... Um, getting the scientists involved, the, the data scientists uh, with the computer science and involved in developing these applications for kids to use and teachers to make it a part of our class. I would completely agree with what Shauna just said. I, I would also add that as we create these, these tools, whatever they are, we need to give students and teachers some tutorials. Yeah. Here's how you use this. And then here's a data set that I've partially managed and curated for you, a sandbox for you to do some work in before I turn you loose on the bigger piece. I think that just creating the tools themselves are of limited value. It's unrealistic to assume, especially in all of our schools, but especially our rural schools, that the one science teacher who is covering physical, chemical, and biological sciences and probably leading a club and coaching something else is going to be able to figure out how to use even a super self-explanatory app because they have so many other demands on their time. So how can we scaffold that so that the, the game, the app, the tutorial is doing a lot of that to at least help those students move to the next stage? But couldn't the video be like attached to, or couldn't a video um, like utilizing your YouTube channel to say, hey, you know, this is a new new application, and you know, here's how you use it. Um, here is an example of you know two different human uh, sequences. So you know, I I think that that would potentially be the scaffold that we need, and that's also YouTube is also something that's accessible on a cell phone. So, well, before we go to the Q and A, I just want to both of you have mentioned a lot of resources for teachers. Um, we will try, I think we can do this, we will try to capture those from you. And then when this um, talk is post posted on our website, in the comments section, we can put some of those resources. So the Louisa Stark resource, the PG Ed, I, I believe we're allowed to, to do capture material from your lecture and provide those links for those of you that uh, some of them went by too fast or you don't wanna have to rewind we will put a collection of um, Neil and Chandra approved genomics and science uh, resources in the chat if we're allowed. Um, I now wanna turn it over to Chris, who has been um, monitoring the Q&A as they've come in uh, and will uh, kind of translate through the Q&A and consolidate some of the multiple questions for you. Yeah, thank you, Larry. And we did have quite a number of people who wanted to thank you and tell you that they were inspired by your presentation. So I want to pass that on to you. So one of the questions that we got relates to something that you were just talking about here near the end, which is, are there any cool new technologies, including ones obviously that are not astronomically expensive, that you see coming that will help teach genomics and biology? I think Shonda, what you were just talking about with Instagram Live and Facebook Live, in a way, that's uh, not a lot of us, I think, might think about doing that. But in a way, that that's a technology that has been, it sounds like, helping you teach genomics and biology. Absolutely. Well, you know, if you want to think about it like that, um, I, I don't know if y'all have watched, uh, but one of the latest crazes is TikTok. And teachers are taking over TikTok. And um, that might be a space for uh, <laughs> genomics researchers to tap into um, and that would help with their storytelling and communication because you could practice and, you know, if people grasp it or grab a hold to it, um, you know, that means that you are doing well or if it's something that you don't get a lot of likes or <laughs> a lot of interactions with, you know, that might be telling you that you should potentially try to tweak your methods of uh, sending out your message. Um, I've seen several um, videos that communicate um, like the planets and their relationship to the sun, um, photosynthesis. So I, I think it's definitely a space to, to utilize social media. And um, I've had great success with that in, in my rural community with my students. I don't, I wouldn't say, you know, everybody is on this, but you know, it's definitely worth giving it a try. 
think that we've just seen the enormous possibilities that come from virtual learning from the last year and a half. And I think we also have, are going to see an explosion in better tools to help us communicate in a virtual format. You know, one of the, one of the things that we discovered when we took all of our programs virtually is that we were able to interact with educators and students around the globe that we would never have reached otherwise. So I think there is an opportunity there provided that we aren't just communicating science in the historical way that we've done that uh, with all of us staring at a Zoom screen. But I think that is, an, uh, is something we're gonna see more of. I don't think we're gonna lose that kind of virtual opportunity. As, as, as communities create more and more, as the scientific community creates more and more tools for scientists, for their colleagues to use, there's an incredible uh, pathway for people that are thinking about how can I convert this or how can I modify this for the audience one step or two steps below its original use. And there's something powerful about giving students access to the same tools that scientists use to make discoveries. We just have to think about the training wheels and the sandbox that goes along with that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's something we need to think about. So I think kind of a, you're leading into another question, which a couple of people asked different versions of, but our director asked first, so I'll let him ask the question, which is that getting students excited about seeing microbes swimming in pond water when examined under a microscope is likely more straightforward than getting them excited about DNA sequence, which is less visually thrilling. Um, speak for yourself, Eric. But anyway, uh, what hooks do each of you use to get younger students just as excited about genomes and DNA sequence as they get about seeing microbes in pond water? I can talk about that because um, I, I kind of jumped into it. But whenever it's something that's, you know, you can't see, uh, I use what students like and my students love food. So we use modeling. So different types of candies, different anything that they can eat it to. Uh, that's one of my methods. So even Play-Doh um, modeling when we're looking at genomic sequences, construction paper, like this is when you go back to arts and crafts. So I tell my students, I said, I know you thought that coloring was elementary school or middle school, but no, we're pulling this out and we're using this to model. Uh, when I teach uh, even a topic as simple as, um, or as complex, of course, as protein synthesis, we do a draw to learn. So my students actually draw out the cell. They, they draw out the nucleus. They draw a uh, um, DNA strand. They draw it opening up and the mRNA strand um, pairing the, the base pairs and so on and so forth. And we walk through the process and that is how, you know, they actually get a visualization, even though it might not be, you know, accurate uh, or to scale, but it helps them grasp the concept when we have the modeling and, you know, using anything that's available in the classroom. It's like, I might not have access to probes. I have to drive an hour to get those, but I do have some construction paper, Play-Doh, color pencils, markers, and all of that in my classroom. So I start with that. We actually, you know, and, and Shonda talked about this as well. I would never underestimate the power of a DNA extraction. Uh, and I know a lot of people are like, we do that. I've done that. I've done thousands of those. For, for the first time for a student doing that, that's very powerful to be able to talk about that you are able to see this thing that up until this point, you haven't even been able to, to get your arms around and that you can do that with stuff that's probably in your kitchen or in your medicine cabinet. Yep. And you can expand that out if you wanna make that more complex and give them a whole set of different soaps and different solutions to make their own extraction buffer or bring in the sushi plate from Publix and have them think about how they're gonna extract from totally different kinds of foods. We also are creating a set of activities for elementary school kids around pets and the differences in different breeds of dogs, for example, and tying back what's genetic and what's environmental. And, you know, younger kids, there's a connect, there's an affinity with animals and there's so much variation yep. uh, within, you know, within whatever animal species you want to talk about. So, so those are some of the ways that, that we look to, to make those those connections. We also have students talk about themselves and look at themselves. We want to step into that carefully because you want, you never know what somebody's 
um, extended family uh, pedigree is like and what their home situation is. So we, we are really careful that we're not doing anything where we're talking about if your parents look like this and you look like this, you know, but I know a lot of people unintentionally stumble into that with the best of intentions. They just don't think about where that goes. So, so I mean, everybody is interested in themselves and in why they are the way they are. And that's a great place to have conversation, but you just want to do that really, really sensitively, not knowing what somebody's own story is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Robberies are very safe in, in that way. In fact, you know, I guess it would be a scaffolding thing to be able to then, I assume the strawberry genome has been sequenced to extract DNA and then next year introduce them to searching the genomes for strawberries. I would like to add one more thing to that. Um, I had, I went to a presentation of two teachers that actually used their, um, they did the 23andMe analysis and they used their results to actually create a problem-based learning activity for their students. Um, to learn a little bit more about um, genomic sequencing uh, as well. So it's, you know, could be potential there. And I know that um, sites like that have uh, created educator resources. I meant to talk about that. They have educator resources um, as well uh, to take a deeper dive into genomics because that's what students know that I, when my kids or families think about DNA. Uh, they think about, you know, some of the shows that they watch about paternity or crime scene investigation and analysis. So uh, really connecting it to um, something that's relevant. And I, I think some of those, um, the, the products like 23andMe, um, that we see the commercials for them all the time could be a potential gateway into exploring this as well. And that connection could take us all the way back. If we go back to what Eric's original question was, it might not be as thrilling as microbes in pond water, but you actually can identify the microbes that were in that pond water by the DNA fragments that they've left behind. And so there's some forensic storytelling, you know, even though you can't see them now, you can tell that they actually were there. How can you identify, you know, lost civilizations or, or, or whatever. Chris, that was a much longer answer than you probably wanted. <laughs> <laughs> we get excited. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know Larry wants to ask you a question about curricula. I uh, just, uh, it was in the, it's my own experience in, in, in our education branch as well as, and it came in as a question as the, um, the, one of the challenges centralized curricula or statewide curricula and trying to squeeze these in uh, under that, or is it just Get, make sure you do the centralized curricula and then do this on top of it. How do you, how do you innovate when the school district has, says you got to cover this, 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 and this uh, in this grade? And so it, it is a challenge. Uh, we're hoping, just to give you a heads up, we're hoping that we can develop some curriculum with some of the national organizations, but school districts still have to accept them. So you have something creative. It's not in the centralized plan that comes in from the state or the school district. How do you work it in? I deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> I deal with that on a, a daily basis. It's challenging. I teach um, advanced placement biology, which is a high stakes test course, tested course. And I teach uh, biology one, which is the state examination as well. And, you know, the kids get super interested in molecular biology, the biotechnology um, aspect. But, you know, I was like, this is the topic that we can only spend like three days on, depending on how you pace it. But my extension to the community, um, doing the community DNA day and um, doing the extension activities for the students or making it a, on, a, a, a passion project or an ongoing project for students, that's the way that I have been able to fit it into the curriculum. Meaning it's not, has, it's not necessarily a part of the structured curriculum every day that I teach, but it, I had to turn it into an ongoing project because it's one of my favorite topics now. Um, I noticed the reason that I started going out to um, places to get training in um, uh, these topics uh, is because it was the most missed on our state examination as well. So they send us a report at the end of the year and it says students are struggling with these topics, biotechnology, um, molecular biology. And I was like, okay, how can I get training to help the students? But it's because, you know, you only have 
you're supposed to spend five days or three days on topic that would take much longer um, to teach. So I had to get creative by figuring out how I could extend it and make it something that students work on on their own or independently. But, but that's a challenge for all teachers that teach these high stakes examinations because most of the time these topics are covered in courses where we have a state mandated test. Mm -hmm. I think you also look for ways that you can bring other mandated content into the story to reinforce that. So it is an, you can use this in place of something rather than on top of something. But then at the end of the day, sometimes your best bet is to look for your informal science groups, like your after school clubs, your boys and girls club, um, you know, summer programs and build curriculum where you've got a little bit more breathing room uh, to tell some of those stories. There are ways to do it in both cases, but it, it, it can be really challenging. And you have to convince your educators, but you also have to convince in some cases their administrators to spend time yeah. on something. And, the, and is that going to hurt their school's ability to have the kind of test scores that they need? Yeah. And I was told, uh, honestly, uh, just speaking about the events that I do surrounding DNA Day and everything like that, to raise community awareness. I was told flat out at one point, you know, that this is some, isn't something that people are participating in, or this isn't something that will work in our community. But, you know, building the relationships with the community, you know, I was happy to prove, you know, some of the naysayers wrong to see that it's something that the community actually um, invested in. And that was, you know, just some of the colleagues that just did not see something like that happening um, throughout our community. So I think that, you know, it would take definitely having an ear to the leadership, the, the superintendents, um, the, the principals of our schools to say, hey, this is what we need to do and this is why it's important and connecting it to, you know, preparing students for uh, college and careers after this. It's like if we're, we, we have a STEM focus, you know, these are skills that they need to be able to be prepared for these jobs for the future. And that's what we want to do um, in our school. So thinking about an approach in our administrators and leadership that way um, was helpful for me. I think we're running out of time. I think Chris is our timekeeper. I want to end on a, you know, an up note, not the struggle of the curriculum, but the inspiration on defeating the curricula and, and extending it beyond where it is today. Uh, just want to thank you both for doing what you do actually every day, not just the hour and a half you've spent with us uh, and inspiring uh, students everywhere. I just want to add there's an extra power to this because students end up teaching their parents uh, a lot. And, um, you know, in certainly uh, I don't see any downside to having more people understand and learn science be they uh, formal students or informal lifelong students. And I, I, you're both contributing a lot to that. And I think the better understanding of genomics will come from not just uh, the researchers lab benches, but also from the general public as well. Uh, so I really wanna thank you for taking the time uh, with us. And uh, as I said, we will try to capture some of the resources. This uh, video will be archived uh, it should show up in about a week, I think, on our website. And um, I'll give the last words to Neil and Chandra, and then we will sign off. Chandra, ladies first. Yes, um, I would just like to say that I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity to present and uh, share about the amazing genomics work that's taken place in my community. And, you know, it doesn't matter where you are or what, what, resources you have or you know if people try to prevent you from making something happen that is possible and my students and the teachers in my school the science team in my school we work together to make this happen and ultimately it's going to be something that's beneficial uh, for our students and for our community we have several students um, my principal contacted me at graduation last year and said, Ms. Jefferson, you know, some of the freshmen that you taught and the sophomores and the seniors, many of our students decided to pursue careers in STEM. And, you know, we're, I'm, I'm making an impact, you know, this community efforts are, are making an impact on our students. And I'm hopeful that it'll contribute to 
um, diversifying the STEM workforce and diversifying genomics. And I know that that's a mission of the National Human Genome Research Institute. So I'm happy to be contributing to that. I would say kudos to NHGRI for making one of their bold predictions about education and the importance of education and then giving Shonda and I the chance to talk about how that has to be scaffolded. That's a, such an important part that often is, is left by the wayside. And collaboration is gonna be the key. It's a relationship between scientists and educators in the classroom and curriculum crafters and science communicators. It's gonna take all of us to move us to these broader, not just the education component, but then the application and the uses of science in society. So mm -hmm. it, it, it is a team, it is team science in every sense of the way. Yes. Okay, again, thank you, Neil. Thank you, Shonda. Thank you out there for uh, your attention and listening to the talk. I just wanna say I, the next talk in the series is, and I wrote it down somewhere, July 12th, um, bold prediction number six uh, will be tackled on July 12th. And I don't have them memorized, otherwise I would say what bold prediction six was, but given the speakers, I know it's, it has to do with probably with clinical translation. So thank you again for your attention. Thank you.